Everyone can hear me? <clears throat> Excellent. OK, uh, so this is actually going to be a two-part talk. Uh, the first part will be slides. So Seth kind of misled people yesterday because I misled him. Um, and there will actually be slides and talking. And then hopefully we'll be able to have a little bit of a discussion about uh, trying to use Bro at larger scale and hopefully be able to engage some of the people in the audience to talk about things that they've done to get Bro to work at large scale. Absolutely, yeah. When we get to the discussion, once the slides are finished, we'll turn off the recording so that hopefully people feel a little more free to talk about what they may be doing at their installation and not be concerned about operational security. So first, let's talk a little bit about OpenFlow and how we use OpenFlow uh, to build a load balancer uh, for a very reasonable price. Um, First of all, the IU network. Uh, IU, I work at Indiana University in the University Information Security Office there. Worked there for a couple years. I run uh, all of the network intrusion detection gear. Um, Indiana University is uh, two main campuses, uh, primarily at Bloomington and Indianapolis. And then we also have five uh, decent sized regionals spread across the state. Um, the core campuses are uh, all 10 gig. We have 10 gig feeds to the internet. Uh, and then we also have uh, 10 gigabit feeds between all of our core routers at both of the primary campuses. Um, we've got nine core routers at Bloomington, and we've got nine, uh, seven core routers at IUPUI. I was tasked with a project to try to figure out how to be able to get feeds from all of these routers uh, and feed them into a load balancer and start producing useful actual intelligence out of that. Um, just to give you an idea, there's about, when the students return in a few weeks, there will be about 85,000 students at IUPUI and IU Bloomington, and over 100,000 for all of the campuses. And as everybody has noted, um, every one of these students has two or three or four or five little network devices. They have Xboxes in their dorm rooms and iPads and phones, and um, it's a pretty big network uh, and a pretty big challenge to be able to keep up with. So that's sort of the, the network diagram, uh, the bowl of spaghetti, um, of our, uh, our two core campuses, which were the ones that we needed to be able to deploy the uh, load balancer on. Um, what we use to be able to get feeds is we're actually using mirrors, unidirectional mirrors, off of the routers. Um, our networking group uh, is uh, not fond of taps. Uh, and so in order to be able to be cooperative, um, and because we were using mirrors before, we used unidirectional, we used mirrors off of uh, span ports, basically. We did unidirectional mirrors so that we could be able to get inbound packets for all of the core routers. Uh, all of the ones that are red dots are going to be your inbound um, packet copies. And then at the border, we got outbound copies so that once we fed all of these, uh, multiplexed all of these feeds together, we were able to actually have a complete view of the network and minimize the amount of duplicate traffic that we would see. Um, we had a serious problem when we initially went with bi-directional mirrors where we had a lot of duplicate traffic that we would see off of both routers because of the wide visibility that we have. We looked at some commercial services, our commercial offerings, um, and there are a lot of, of really nice load balancers that are available. Um, that you can pay a pretty nice penny for, and they'll work very well. Um, but since we're a university, we don't have a very big budget. Uh, when we started looking at commercial offerings, we found that if we bought commercial offerings that would work at the scale that we have, we would end up wiping out most of the budget we had for NIDS and not have very much money left over for actual analysis hardware. Um, we have InCenter, uh, which is the Indiana Center for Network Translational Research and Education. They have a strong interest in using OpenFlow. Uh, and so we partnered with them to try to create a practical application of OpenFlow, which was building a load balancer that would be able to take all of these feeds and load balance them across our cluster. Um, one of the advantages, they were willing to provide us with programming expertise to write the application. Um, they had access to hardware that we could test on so that we wouldn't have to buy hardware and find out it didn't work. Um, so that gave us a couple of advantages that allowed us to try to make this project work. So what is OpenFlow? Um, it is the dominant component of software-defined networking. 
Um, it is implemented and supported by several different vendors who have switches that will support OpenFlow. Um, it is uh, deployed on a bunch of different campuses. There are universities that are using it experimentally and in research. And it's also good enough for Google. Um, they announced at a flow conference, uh, an OpenFlow conference this summer that they had converted their entire data center network over to use all OpenFlow capable switches. Um, clearly they have access to the programming expertise and they also have the budget to be able to get switches that work. Um, but that's very large volume networks that they're now running on OpenFlow hardware. So it works in a production environment and our little toy also works in a production environment. So software defined networking and I'll refer to it as OpenFlow from here on out. Uh, traditionally when you're dealing with networking hardware, the control plane and the data plane are both enclosed within your switch. They're locked down in firmware and the vendor writes the software to do the control plane side and the data plane side where your actual packets are moving. The idea with OpenFlow is you separate the control plane out into commodity hardware and general purpose programming languages where you can start writing your own applications that handle the control plane side of things. So if you want to write your own specialized wireless controller, uh, you, if you have the programming access uh, or skill, you can go ahead and uh, write your own application that would do something special. Um, if you're trying to build a big research network that you want to be able to have dynamically allocate bandwidth for different applications, uh, you can write an application that will do that for you. Um, before, especially if you were dealing with these sort of niche applications, it was really hard to find vendors that would be able to support those sort of options. So control plane software, uh, you essentially have commodity hardware, uh, and then there are a number of different controllers that are available. Um, they all work in high-level languages, uh, primarily Java and C++. Uh, there used to be one controller that was written in Python, but it has apparently been retired, and now that project is, is primarily C++. But Beacon and Floodlight are both Java-based. We ended up selecting Beacon uh, to use as our uh, controller, and that's what we wrote our application on. So very quickly, I'll try to go through a little bit about how OpenFlow works, and then we'll talk about how we actually built our load balancer. Um, so what you're doing is using your controller to interact with the data plane. Um, you want to be able to insert and delete flows from the switch, uh, which will tell you how packets get routed. Um, you need to be able to pull statistics from the switch so that you can see how you can do traffic analysis um, you can do uh, monitoring of bandwidth and, and monitor how your switch is actually behaving. And you also need to be able to watch the status of the switch and components within the switch. And these are all things that happen outside of the switch in your control plane uh, in the controller that you wrote. Um, flows are essentially headers to match against packets. Um, so what you have, and then you also have counters. Uh, every flow will have a counter associated with it. Uh, and then you have some sort of action. Um, the actions that you have are pretty wide. You can strip MPLS tags off of, uh, uh, off of packets, strip VLAN headers, uh, apply VLAN headers, make changes to the packets, or just simply output to specific ports based on the characteristics that you match, which is essentially <clears throat> the way that we use this, is our primary focus was to match packets in a certain way and then output them on our desired ports. That's a brief list of the different things that you can actually match against in OpenFlow. Um, so you have pretty much the full range of header data that you can match against. Um, a few flow examples. Uh, you have um, your first example up here is essentially saying anything that has a network source of 192.168.1.5 uh, is over TCP um, and has a pri the priority I'll get to in a moment. Um, output that to ports five and six. Uh, with flows, you can assign priorities to the flows, which is how the switch is able to decide when a packet matches two or more rules, which rule wins in the match. And that's done by highest priority. Um, you also have uh, the next rule is packets that have uh, 86DD as the DL type. Um, do nothing, drop them. We don't want to see those kind of packets. Um, and then the last one is just another simple data type um, matching at a lower priority and outputting to a single port. 
So what we did is wrote an application called FlowScale. Um, we had a few different requirements. Uh, we wanted to be able to use commodity, a commodity switch to be able to distribute flows evenly across a number of output ports. Um, we needed to be able to process at 10 gigabit line rate, and we needed to be able to process multiple 10 gig feeds. Um, we needed to have resilience, so if a switch port went down, we needed the controller to be smart enough to handle that um, and rebalance the flows across the remaining ports. Um, we had a need to be able to mirror traffic because a lot of our infrastructure has been based around using Snort, like a lot of places, and we're still in a position where we rely heavily, probably too heavily still, upon using Snort um, and are migrating toward Bro. So we needed to be able to use both tools in our cluster and being able to run Snort and Bro together on a single box didn't work for the load balancing tool that we had on the box. So we wanted to be able to mirror. It's also really useful if you have other interesting things that you want to be able to do. Um, people talked about using uh, Time Machine. Uh, if you can mirror every packet that goes to your Bro nodes and also dump it to a box that's doing Time Machine, that would seem to be pretty handy. Um, and then we also needed to have the flow scale application be able to be responsive to external alerts. So we needed to be able to interact with it uh, and tell it to reroute traffic based on certain characteristics that we had defined. So even distribution, the idea was we have a number of routers that we're feeding into our open flow switch, uh, and then we need to be able to load balance those across the sensors. Um, fairly straightforward. Session information may not be broken. Um, the idea there is because of how we're getting our feeds, we may see one direction of conversation on one feed and the other direction of the conversation on another feed. And we needed to be able to make sure that both directions of the uh, session get routed to the same box so that state can be kept and, and all of the tools work nicely with that. We also needed to be able to deal with the fact that uh, we might want to be able to do, as the example here says, we want to match anything that has TCP or UDP port 53 and shove all of that data to a single box. Uh, when we initially deployed this, we were still generating our DNS logs uh, the old-fashioned way, uh, TCP dump, right to a pipe, right to syslog, and dump to a log host. And we needed to be able to support that until we were able to use Bro to gather that data. Um, and then rules needed to be able to match up to layer four. So we needed to be able to do ports um, or anything like that. Um, traditionally, load balancers often work in a reactive way. Uh, as a new connection comes in, it does a hash, it does some sort of lookup, and then determines where that output goes. Uh, we looked at that as a strategy, but unfortunately, because the controller logic is where all of that hashing has to go on, um, making calls out from the open flow switch to the controller and then back to the switch to get a flow inserted proved to be much too uh, time consuming uh, and started to flood the bandwidth of the connection between the switch. So that approach didn't work. What we ended up having to do is we thought about, well, we have control over our IP space. We know what all of the ranges are that we're working with. So we simply decided to divide the IU subnets into smaller chunks and then load balance based on that. So if you're in the top half of 134.68, uh, you go to this to node 1. If you're in the bottom half, you go to node 2. Um, that's a very, very simple description of how we designed this. So the next requirement was being able to hot swap flows. Um, so once we have all of this traffic moving across, Throughout the day, you may find that bandwidth increases or decreases on a given subnet, and we needed to be able to break that subnet down into smaller chunks and then distribute it across the other sensors that were getting a smaller load. The goal was to try to keep as even a uh, packet count across all of the output ports as possible. And all of this is done in an automatic fashion. The flow scale application looks at the switch, gathers statistics, makes determinations on which parts of the subnets, which subnets are more active, and then rebalances the remaining flows across the, uh, across the other workers. Neat little diagram. The other requirement was resilience. Um, a, uh, a sensor may die. Uh, a sensor may become overloaded and crash completely. And the flow scale switch, a flow scale application needed to be able to notice that that was occurring uh, and then take action and rebalance traffic. So in this example, sensor two dies, uh, it gets overloaded, fails for some reason. 
the open flow switch will automatically take all of the flows that were going to sensor two and redistribute them across the remaining sensors in the cluster. And then we also needed to be able to mirror traffic. So we wanted everything that went to sensor one to be written out to sensor three. Um, we're actually overloading because in our design, uh, which we'll, I'll show a little bit later, um, we're kind of grouping things together uh, in not a perfect even one-to-one -one situation. And then finally, the responsive to alerts. Um, when a machine kernel panics, sometimes the interface doesn't actually go down. So the switch won't recognize that uh, that box is no longer functional, but we have Nagios monitoring. So Nagios needed to be able to notice that that box was no longer responsive and send a notice to the flow scale application. At that point, uh, the flow scale application will behave just like it would if it had noticed that the uh, sensor had gone down, take the flows that are going there, rebalance them across the remaining uh, sensors. So this is sort of a, a very rough functional diagram of what our two clusters look like. Um, we have a cluster at Bloomington, we have a cluster at IUPUI. Um, they wouldn't give me a fiber between the two campuses, so I uh, had to build two clusters. Um, I was happy to shove all the data from one campus to the other. But we ended up with uh, seven sensors that are running bro, so traffic is load balanced across to those seven sensors. And then we have four sensors that are running snort. Uh, so the flows that are fed from uh, to sensors one through seven, essentially sensors one and two are combined together and fed to sensor seven, uh, and so on. And then we also have a default IP and IPv6 host. Um, one of the shortcomings of OpenFlow right now is that it can't match on IPv6 addresses. Um, that is going to be addressed in a, a future specification. So we needed to be able to identify IPv6 traffic and sho shove that to a single sensor that's running a bro instance uh, on that box and gathering data. And then there's also the possibility that we could end up having missed a subnet somewhere or if our networking group adds uh, some IP space and we don't know about it, our rules wouldn't have that. Um, so there is a default rule that basically says, if you don't match anywhere, drop it over to sensor 12. Uh, this diagram also demonstrates, uh, when we were doing this in testing initially, uh, we were using an IBM switch at uh, IUPUI, and we were using a Pronto switch at IU Bloomington, and we were using one controller to control both switches, and the other controller was in a backup. So that demonstrates the idea that uh, OpenFlow is hardware uh, is vendor agnostic. Um, as long as the switch supports OpenFlow, um, you don't have to worry about necessarily whether it will play nicely with uh, with any given switch. Um, we tried a couple different switches, and they all worked reasonably well. Uh, we ended up settling on IBM switches for for our production deployment. Very very quickly. Uh, just a basic uh, graph here to show that uh, packets accumulated over a three-day period. Uh, this was back when our network was still very, very busy. Um, and you can see that there is a fairly even distribution over a three-day period of traffic. So there is some hot spotting that occurs. That's a problem that you're going to deal with with any load balancer. Um, someone uh, becomes very, very chatty, um, and you end up with a hot spot or overloading a sensor. Um, but over a reasonable period of time, the distribution of packets was very even, um, which proved that, that what we had written worked. And on a smaller window, uh, a little 30-minute window, again, there's a fairly even distribution of packet count across all of the output ports. Um, there's only five here because this was when we were still in testing. And then a real quick graph to show with mirroring, you're going to have a very small amount of loss. Um, we measured it at, at well below 1%, um, but the graphs show that, that uh, it's very, very close. Um, so there is actually very little loss in doing the mirroring action. We're only doing two mirrors at this point. We've talked about whether it would be interesting to try three or four mirrors um, and start being able to plug more tools in. Um, if we need to be able to keep running Snort for a while, we still want to look at something like Time Machine. So a future thing would be to figure out um, if we start adding on more mirrors, does that cause us to have more packet loss? So limitations. Uh, as I noted, IPv6, direct IPv6 address matching is not supported right now. Um, the other problem is that when the rebalancing action occurs, there is the potential to break a session um, because it requires a lot of logic to identify 
a small portion of a CIDR block that is not active um, on a network as active as ours, um, if you find chunks of IP space that aren't active at all, they're probably never going to be active. So rebalancing them is not going to gain you much. So we do occasionally have a little bit of session breaking. Um, but because most of the traffic that you're interested in is at the very beginning of a connection, um, and if you're breaking a long running connection, uh, that doesn't really hurt us for, for what we're trying to do. Future work is trying to deal with that session breaking by going to much finer grained flows. Um, can we go down? How small down can we go? Obviously, moving a single slash 32 isn't going to be a workable deal, but can we look at smaller and smaller chunks and maybe be able to identify a moment in time when a given small, small chunk of IP space is inactive and be able to shuttle that over to another box for load balancing? Um, potentially also the ability to distribute flows based on the weight of the sensor. Um, this is something that works towards scaling down for smaller deployments. Uh, we're 10 gigabit all the way through to our workers, so we really weren't concerned about overloading a given worker. But if you're taking a single 10 gig feed and trying to load balance that across to a bunch of 1 gigabit workers, you need to be able to identify that that worker can only handle up to about 750 megabits. When you start to get close to that output, a rebalancing process needs to occur. So figuring out how to do that uh, is something that we want to do in the future and be able to see if this works for smaller operations. Um, and then, of course, as everybody's noted, scaling up to 100 gigabit would also be really interesting. Um, I've been told that Brocade has an open flow capable 100 gigabit switch. Um, and so I'd like to be able to get my hands on one of those and see if we can scale this up to 100 gigabit. Um, we'll see if that works. Um, some of that would be something that Bro may be able, actually able to help us out with. Um, as people have noted, shunting is something that can help you decrease the traffic load that your sensors have to deal with. So it would be really interesting. The example that I've mentioned to a couple people in talking to them is uh, in the research world, there are a lot of parallel grid FTP transfers. They're very large data transfers, and you probably don't care about the content of those data transfers. So it would be really cool to be able to teach Bro to identify the grid FTP control channel have it pick out the data transfer channels, the, the hosts that are involved in that, and then signal to our OpenFlow controller and tell it to throw that traffic on the floor. You would still get counters if you apply the rules correctly, so you would get packet counts that you could get a reasonable guess whether the clients actually transferred the amount of data that you thought they were going to, um, but you wouldn't be shoving all of that traffic onto your analysis nodes. Also, long transfers. Um, if you can teach Bro to say, if a transfer runs past X volume or X amount of time, signal to the OpenFlow controller to shunt that to the floor um, so that it's not even going to your, to your systems anymore. The other interesting thing is, imagine if your whole network is OpenFlow capable. Um, now, uh, if you have a client that gets infected, uh, rather than doing DHCP jailing or null routing at a router, uh, what if you can turn their switch port off automatically and, and have that sort of reaction um, and get as close as possible to the actual infected client? Um, or if you have a box that is doing something questionable, uh, rate limit the amount of traffic that they can push out uh, that gives you a chance to investigate what is going on there and make a determination as to whether this is actually malicious. Um, if you think you have a data, data exfiltration uh, uh, event going on, um, especially in the, the EDU world, uh, people are not usually really responsive to you just shutting off their network connections willy-nilly. But what if you can rate limit them for a short period of time to be able to analyze what's going on and make a determination? Um, open flow across your entire network would be pretty cool, I think. So really quickly, uh, what we've got for back-end hardware is uh, we're running uh, we're all Dell hardware. Uh, we've got a nice R510 that works as our manager. Um, 12 cores, 24 gigs of RAM, a terabyte and a half of disk. There are actually two clusters. There's one, so this is duplicate hardware at both campuses. Um, and then we've got 12 workers behind it that are running uh, 12 core, um, 24 gigs of RAM. We threw 300 gig SAS drives on there because for some of them, they're going to be writing Snort fast alert, or uh, Snort unified output, so we need a disk base. Row, obviously, you can go with much smaller disks because the workers don't really need much disk space. Some of those are, are snorts, 
Yes, um, four of these nodes are running Snort. Um, and then also the 12th node, I forgot to mention when I was working through that, is also our PCAP host. Uh, so if we have a need to take full packet capture of a given host, we can redirect that traffic to the uh, default node and run TCP dump on there. And we've reconfigured uh, Mircom to run in a mirroring arrangement, um, which I'll get to that in a moment. Um, we're running Mircom 10 gig NICs, and then we used HP direct attached cables to be able to feed from the switch to the workers. Um, and that's worked out really well. Um, Unfortunately, with the IBM switches, you're optically locked to buy their optics, and uh, they're really nice folks, but I'm sure they're making a lot of money off of their optics. Um, and being able to use HP direct attached cables saved us a whole lot of money um, to be able to do a deployment of this size. Um, we run FreeBSD uh, on all of our workers and managers, um, but the controller runs Ubuntu because that was what the developer wanted to run on, um, and it was his, his box. Uh, the controller is a little Dell R310. Um, I think it's got four or eight gigs of RAM and four cores. Um, honestly, you could probably run the controller on your iPhone. Um, it's not very CPU intensive. Um, because of the way that we've done this, it doesn't have a lot of bandwidth needs. So you can use really low, uh, really low powered hardware to be able to run your controller on and save a lot of money that way. On our boxes, we're actually using Miracom for our load balancing. So we have two levels of load balancing going on. Um, we're running uh, 10 bro workers for each box, so we've got 70 bro workers in our cluster, uh, and we're running seven snort instances per box, so we've got 28 snort instances running. Um, Miracom load balances that into 10 rings. You basically export a set of environment variables, and Miracom sets up those, uh, sets up those rings, uh, and then each worker reads off of a different ring. Um, one of the downsides is that you don't really have visibility into what the bandwidth is per ring. Um, you only have a way to be able to get bandwidth usage at the NIC level. Um, so there's always a question of if you see 800 megabits going to a single worker, it's hard to tell is that going to a one single worker or is that being spread across all of your workers. Go forward. Um, so really quick, some performance numbers. Um, when the students are around, uh, over a 24-hour period, we average about three gigabits per second. Um, it spikes up to five to seven when they're awake and looking at Facebook or Flickr or YouTube or whatever they do in class. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, in the summer, uh, we get a brief reprieve where we get to catch our breath. Our traffic loads drop by about half. Uh, most of our students disappear. Um, so we get a chance to do projects like we did here um, on a much smaller scale. Um, in Bro, we're using the capture loss uh, script to be able to get an idea uh, of how much traffic we're losing. Um, and we see, right now, we see less than 1%. Um, when the students are around, we see about 3 to 5%. We do get some spikes up above 10% um, that are probably short-term high, uh, high burst traffic. Um, and that's one of the things to investigate is figuring out if we can use Bro to identify where those spikes are occurring and have it do some re reconfiguring. Um, we generate about 10 to 15,000 logs per second um, on our, and that's right now, so that'll double in a couple of weeks. Um, it's about 10 gigabits or 10 gigabytes uh, of data per hour uncompressed is what our current, our, our Bro current directory gathers. Um, the threaded logging code has been amazing for being able to deal with the volume of logs that we have. Um, we're, we're able to basically run all of the logs. We run con.log, we run HTTP. Um, the only thing we don't log is syslog um, because we would probably run out of disk space really fast. We have a very, very active log host. Um, and so we don't log syslog, but otherwise we log everything that Bro can do. Um, we don't have to turn off any of our logs. Any questions about OpenFlow? <laughs> <laughs>